I hope they go really fast and we fall off the sides. Oh, me too. I hope the kids do and break their leg. Oh, no, I don't. That's so mean. I don't know that. You can go your own way. Go your own way. All right, here at Malabar Farm Visitor Center. Got the family here with me. Shawshank Redemption was filmed here. It's a short little scene. I am not the most kid-friendly scene, but I see nevertheless. Getting ready for oh, the... I always smile and then you push record and I'm like... <laughs> you just sit there and smile the whole time. And, yeah, it makes you look goofy. <laughs> We're getting ready to do a little... Um, what kind of ride is this? A tractor ride. Welcome to Malabar Farm, home of a man called Louis Bromfield. Uh, what is he known for? Father cons conservation or conservation farming and sustainable agriculture. But unfortunately for him, he died at the age of 59 in 1956. So a lot of his awards came after he died. He kind of faded away from our attention. Uh, I think if he could have lived into the 1960s, and he could have, he was such a heavy, 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 heavy smoker. He never not had a cigarette in his hand, they said, like that. Uh, but some of the ideas, he came here in 1938, war chased him out of Europe. I think he would have stayed in Europe if it hadn't been for the war. Very successful writer, 13 books in 13 years, 13 bestsellers. He was making $400,000 a year in sales over there during the 30s. Came back here in 1938, uh, bought three farms. One of his books sold to Hollywood, got $35,000 for it. So where you parked your car was one farm, this was one farm. And the next one we stop at is the third farm. This one and the next one were run by tenant farmers. He said the erosion was so great on these farms that there was nothing to grow but rocks here. That's all. And they were farming from the road to the stream over there like this. So when the rains came, the furrows acted like water slides. So it walked. he said America's greatest export was soil, not any crop, but soil. So what did he do? He turned the fields this way. Uh, they followed the lay of the land. That was the Thomas Jefferson idea. His farm manager promoted it. So when the winds came, they went across the fields like this and it held on to the water better. And then he also rotated crops. They were planting corn way too much because corn is a taker crop. It also depleted the soil. Plant soybeans the next year, it puts nitrogen into the soil that the corn takes out. Uh, so it's following the lay of the land. Also by following the lay of the land, it let the water run off the land clear. So when we get down, to, when we turn on this road uh, and head by the, uh, there's a hiking trail down there, but you can see how the water comes out of the field. It's running like a giant swale. So we had a French drain system put in. It was called French draining because the man that designed his last name was French. He was a home builder from Massachusetts, not because Bromfield lived in France. He liked to see the animals here. He said, if the animals are on the property, I guess we can live here too. Just as I turned the corner, I saw the deer flip-flopping through the field over there. I don't know if anybody else caught that or not. I saw a groundhog. There it is. Yeah. Oh, 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 how cute. The young ones. <laughs> Looking at it. Got their bibs on. Yeah. They like to stare at us too. Yeah. The beans hide them pretty good, so does the corn like that. But Bromfield was amazed by deer, and I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out why he was. And then I found out, 1905, the deer were gone in Ohio. There no no recorded deer in 1905. 1930, about 30,000 deer. Last year, 750,000 deer. Oh, wow. We have done a really wow. good How job cute. of making deer come back. And who, who keeps track of the deer now? It's called the... <laughs> car insurance company. I was going to say, <laughs> like that. Uh, you're, 
your body shops are You might want to get those before we take off. I just hope it. Okay. So some of the birds that have now left, the last set of birds I was keeping an eye on were the barn swallows. They eat 10 times their weight in insects every day. They're the barn swallows. They were here last weekend. They're not here this weekend, but this is when they normally migrate. So that's a good sign. One year they left the 1st of August. That was a bad sign. Yeah. <laughs> we had a hard winter. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, huh? Interesting. Yeah, I'm good. Shoes on. Like yeah, like leave it to my son to ruin the uh, the speech, the the, uh, the tourism. I was going to say, how did you This is my Yeah, there you go. As a natural fence, and he promoted it as a natural fence during the war when they needed the metal to go to the war effort. It's called Moldaflower Rose. Well, they used it and it got out of hand. And by the 60s, it's an invasive plant, uh, mostly because it makes this berry that you see on it right now. And the birds eat the berries. Does anybody know where the birds go to the bathroom? <laughs> Anywhere they Wherever and anywhere. You know, and the plant took over. So by the 1960s, a couple years after Mr. Bromfield was dead, the plant is called Bromfield's Folly. Because okay. once it gets once it gets a hold, there's nothing to do but other than dig it out of the ground, and it's a real pain in the patouche, as my grandmother used to say. So you'll see it everywhere. You'll see it along roads, in any fields that are open that aren't being cared for. It takes over, and some people still blame Bromfield for it. <laughs> he did not invent it, but he did promote it. He had the big mouth. <laughs> celebrates it. It's one of the 88 bicentennial barns they painted in Ohio. Uh, they're due to repaint it again to kind of keep that celebration going. But in 1803, the Native Americans were still living here under the support of the British. I took the War of 1812 to get the British out. And after that, unfortunately for the Native Americans and losing that support, it was easier to push them out. So then more settlers moved in. 1816, the tracks moved in. They built a cabin, then they built the building in 1820 you're looking at. It was a stagecoach stop. The stagecoach went from Marietta, Ohio, all the way to Sandusky, Ohio, or for all the kids on the wagon, all the way to Cedar Point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, so the tracks moved in. They built, a, they built it here because there was a water source. Where you see that person walking up there behind it is a sandstone outcropping. 25,000 years ago, the last glacier was here. Uh, the glacier was called the Wisconsin Glacier. When it receded, it left it, it opened up a spring. The spring's been running 24-7, uh, 1,500 gallons an hour uh, for 25,000 years. The best way to see that water is to go over to the vegetable stand. Mr. Bromfield tiled it up into, into the back of it. It's overflowing, it's going through channels. He designed baskets and boxes of wood that sat over the water and in the water, and the water went through it. The water was always 55 degrees. He had a refrigerator. He had some of the coolest vegetables around. Not only were the vegetables pretty cool, it was who was selling the vegetables. Anybody that came here, he put to work. A man called Jimmy Cagney, an actor in Hollywood, loved to sell vegetables there. Uh, people said when he was here, they said the cars would be lined up for miles on the days they knew he was here, like that. But you can go over and play in the water. Uh, somebody else played in the water back in the War of 1812. His name was Johnny Appleseed. He was here for almost 22 years. Uh, he lived in Perrysville, where his stepsister lived. He had orchards, he had saplings. That's what he gave to the pioneers when they moved in. He didn't give them apples, he didn't give them seeds. He was selling little trees to them like that. While he was here, he slept in a house, ate at a table, took care of 13 kids, and had a girlfriend for a while. Nancy Tannehill was her name. That All that information is in a book called Johnny Appleseed by Will Moses. He was the great grandson of Grandma Moses. It's a big picture book. When Will Moses was here, he shared that information with us and I got one of his autographed books. So I like reading it. But I was surprised when Johnny Appleseed had a girlfriend. So were a lot of girls on the wagon. They go, oh, he had a girlfriend? Oh no, you know what he looked like? I said, yeah. Oh, well. So Johnny Appleseed was here. So go play in the water. You can say I did that. Uh, Mr. Bromfield had 10 bedrooms in that building. That was his guest housing. His goal was to make it a restaurant. He did not live to see that happen. But a restaurant did go in. And last five years, it's been one of our top five 
restaurants in the county because people like the quality of food that they share. But you won't pay McDonald prices either. <laughs> the building back here was one of Mr. Bromfield's experiments. Again, it was a hay drying building. If you look at the corner, you see the barn is up off the ground. While the building was under construction, a company showed up looking for an endorsement. The name of the company was Reynolds Aluminum. They were, they were advertising a new product called siding. So the grayer look of the light gray look on the building, that's the siding they put on 75 years ago. Does siding last? Yes. Does it make a good hay drying building? No. You need a wood building to breathe, not a metal building. But siding was a good alternative to wood if you were just storing things and it would work. So they got a good advertisement out of it. Mr. Bromfield got a C plus or a C minus building for drying hay. <laughs>
Uh, the actor that played the boyfriend in the cabin, he was he was here a couple of years ago. He always had a funny comment. He said, you know, my name is on screen longer than I was. <laughs> they cut out a lot of his parts like that. But that's the Shawshank cabin. The other cabin they just opened up at the beginning of the summer is an overnight cabin. It's called the Maple Sugar Cabin now. You can rent it and be have the only person on the property here when you're here, that, things like that. In between the two cabins is our sugar camp. And then going off into the trees, you can see the blue lines running among the trees. In March, we have a festival here, the Maple Sugar Festival. For two weeks, we had almost 8,000 people here last uh, last winter watching us make syrup like that. So people can come here and see that. Over here is Dave uh, Charles Schrack. He was the brother that built the water mill. The water mill sat over here. Uh, the last family to work the water mill in 1880, the Rose family moved in. In 1896, their daughter, 23-year-old Cecilia, murdered them in the house. Oh. She's become part of a legend now, Ohio's Haunted History. There's a book called Haunted Ohio. She's in the first book, the second chapter, Under Poisoners. She was a special needs adult who fixated on the young man that lived in the house up there and decided to get his attention. She'd make her family go away. Oh. Well, she made her family go away and he ran away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, she was finally figured out how she did it and caught and then was found innocent by reason of insanity and she spent the rest of her life at the Lima State Mental Hospital. She was found innocent by reason of insanity. What was her name again? Cecilia Rose. Cecilia Rose. So you can look her up her like that. She's in the book Haunted Ohio and there's several versions of the story. Almost everybody in the valley tells it a little differently but basically she poisoned him with arsenic around the 4th of July. Dad and brother died in the first round. Mom died in the second round. And then she was caught by about by April, about this time of the year she was caught. The trial lasted. It was a big deal trial. Everybody from all over came to see her like that. But that's who she was. So I'm going to stop. Yeah.